to the Grand Canyon State of Arizona. It's Cactus League Baseball. Spring training 2016 rolls on. We're knocking on the door toward opening day. And the Reds today in Goodyear welcome the defending world champion, Kansas City Royals. Hi again, everybody. Alongside Chris Welsh and Jim Day, I'm Tom Brenneman. Welcome, as always, to Reds Baseball. You know, Chris, so much during the offseason, we heard about Jose Peraza. The young man who came over in the deal from the Dodgers. And so far, he's been as impressive as anybody in this Reds camp. Well, he's a very intriguing player, Tom, mainly because he's got some speed. He can play all around the infield and the outfield. And he's a guy that has shown right now being able to really swing the bat. I like his approach with two strikes. He's a young player. Of course, there's a lot of upside there. I think the Reds are going to give him as much chance as possible to make this ball play. And with the versatility of Peraza, is there a chance he makes the opening day roster? We'll talk more about that as we roll along today. The Royals seeing one of their own who helped lead them to the World Series pitching out of the bullpen in 2014. That's Brandon Finnegan. First pitch right around the corner from Goodyear. You're watching Reds baseball on Fox Sports Ohio. Reds merchandise, including the 47 brand, New Era, Nike, and Pink by Victoria's Secret. Visit the Reds Team Shop by Majestic and purchase your Reds gear today. Make Washington Park your destination for the opening day parade. Festivities include food, games, local craft beers, a giant LED screen, and live music from the menus. For more information, visit WashingtonPark.org. Well, the beat goes on day in, day out, sunshine, blue skies, temperatures a little cooler than the last time we were here, Mr. Welsh, there in the upper 70s, low 80s today. Let's check in for the first time and say hello to our main man, Jim Day. Tom, Chris, how we do it? Brandon Finnegan hits the hill today, and he'll have to keep his emotions in check. Anytime you face the team that traded you away for the first time, there are extra emotions involved. The Royals didn't know whether Finnegan could be a long-term starter. He's out to prove that this spring and this season for the Reds, and you better believe he wants to prove something to the Royals, albeit a spring training game today. Don't tell that to Finnegan. It's a little more for him, I'm sure. Well, even the Royals people, thank you, Jim. Uh, Chris are very excited to see Brandon Finnegan. I mean, he was drafted in the first round, 17th pick overall out of TCU in 2014. Pitch in the College World Series. 
but four months later, he's pitching in the World Series. Yeah, he just didn't pitch in the World Series, Tom. He was an integral part uh, of their postseason run at the very end of the year. Very unusual to see a kid go right from college to the major leagues. Of course, the Reds have had Mike Leake do the same thing over the last few years, but Finnegan really had an impact. And, and I think that he is where he wants to be right now. Not, I'm not meeting these with the Reds, but he's in the starting rotation here. He's a guy that would really rather start than be a reliever. He's getting a full shot at doing that this spring. We'll take a look at the Reds defense. Manager Brian Weiss will play behind Finnegan today. Regulars, Votto, Kozak, Jay Bruce, and Wright. The Aces are not at second, but we're keeping an eye more and more on the left fielder, Shepard, having an excellent spring. And we talked a moment ago about Paraza. And of course, a hearty welcome back last Friday after that terrible, terrible knee injury last year to Zach Koza. Yeah, the one thing you'll notice about Zach Koza, you take a full body shot of him, and he's still wearing that brace on his right leg. I mean, he doesn't have to do that, but he's doing that now, I think, until he gets the confidence that he can move laterally, stop, change directions without putting too much pressure on that surgically repaired knee. He says it's fine, and uh, that's good news for Reds. Well, it's been an amazing two seasons for these Kansas City Royals. They had gone longer than any North American professional sports franchise between playoff appearances, and this is the way they do it. Part of the equation is hitting early in the count. They infrequently walk. And Alcides Escobar on the first pitch of the game, a double down the left field line. Well, you may remember the World Series where Escobar led the bottom of the inning off, or the top of the inning off against Matt Harvey with a first pitch inside the park home run against the New York Mets. He figures Finnegan's coming with a fastball. He gets one and laces it for a double. So now the third baseman, Moustakas. This Kansas City lineup, by and large, is loaded with all of its regular players outside of a spot here and a spot there. They don't have Kane playing in center. They don't have Perez, their catcher, behind a plate. Come back into the mound. Then again, we'll look the runner back, and that's a good out. That came hacking, didn't they? Sure did. Ed Yost. Also World Series two years ago, won it last year. He has Hosmer coming up. Morales a big year last year. His first with the Royals. They re-signed Alex Gordon. Orlando will play right field. Lamar Infante. Raymond Fuentes in center. And Tony Cruz for Perez behind the plate. Of course, Ned Yost was on the brink of leading the Milwaukee Brewers to the playoffs. Was fired with two weeks left to go in the season. We remember that well. It's ball one. Kansas City brought him in. And while they were building this whole thing and the whole fleet of young players coming up together. A magical ride in 14 when they lost to the Giants in seven games. And then winning last year in dominant fashion over the Mets. What do you like about Brandon Finnegan? Well, I like his attitude. I mean, he is a real bulldog. He comes right after you. He doesn't mess around on the mound. He's got a nice pace between pitches. He's a young man who's only 5'11", but so he's effective throwing the ball up in the zone. Gets a lot of swings and misses up there. Oh, Almost a pretty good piece of hitting. He's got a sharp breaking ball, Finnegan does. He doesn't use a lot of his changeup. I think that's a pitch that he's still developing. But he's a guy that really, Tom, that came right out of TC. You feeling like he could pitch in the major leagues, and he's shown everybody around the world of baseball that he can do just that. He was only 22. He will turn 23 on the same day this year in April that Pete Rose will turn 20 to 75. One and two. And it'll stay right there. Two foul balls to the left side give you a little bit of an insight as to why Eric Hosmer is such a good hitter. He waits a long time, fouls off a lot of balls to the left, very much in the same way Joey Votto does. A runner at second, one out. 22 home runs, 82 batted in a year ago for Hosmer. It is a Kansas City team that really goes against all of the numbers. You know, last year at this time, coming off that first trip to the series, 
many of the analytics predicted the Royals would win 79 games last year. Figuring they couldn't be a team that rarely walked. They're also a team that rarely ever strikes out. And figuring no way they could continue to hit the way they hit with runners in scoring position. They were even better last year than they were the year before. Off the inside corner, two and two. And by and large, they have everybody back from last year that started last year. You may remember they added, of course, Johnny Cueto. And they added Ben Silverst, two big pieces of that World Series run. But the group that started the year pretty much back intact. Hard hit ball. And it's 1-0 Kansas City. Well, I think you said something in that list of the things that the Royals do that is very important. You shouldn't gloss over. They may not walk a lot, but they don't strike out a lot. And this is where Finnegan is really looking for a strikeout against Eric Hosmer. He fouled off a couple of really tough pitches, got a breaking ball that was down, maybe even out of the zone, and was able to put it into play. I think the one thing that analytics don't necessarily give a lot of credit to is how good your bullpen can turn your team around. Teams with bad bullpens have a tough time, especially down the stretch. Kendrys Morales, a tapper. They get one. And can't turn into double play. That's Adam Jubal down there at third base. And a long, long time ago, Chris, he was a third baseman as a very young man. He's been primarily an outfielder since. But today, Brian Price wants to find out is he capable again of playing third? Well, you know, versatility on a team that has a lot of its regular lineup spots already taken. You're looking for guys who can play around, uh, lift different positions. Can you play a little outfield? Can you play first base or third if we need you to? And uh, give Joey Votto a rest or give Suarez a rest? I think that's what they are looking for with Jordan Pacheco, who's in camp trying to make the ball club. Same thing for Duvall. Alex Gordon, the batter, takes up and in ball one. Gordon, outstanding defended, among the best in all the baseball in the outfield. And last year, just a lot of time injured. At 13 home runs, 48 batted in, they had decided to bring him back. And he's hit. Got a pitch inside, even against your former team. You know, Brandon Finnegan came into this game, Tom, thinking, well, you know, asked a lot by the media. Hey, what do you think about pitching against your former team, the World Series champs? And he said, well, it's just, just another team. But Jim Day hit on it earlier, and it's true. No matter how many times you say it's just another team, it's still your old team. And it is a team that will award you a World Series ring when they give their rings out on April the 5th. Here's Orlando, and it's an airstrike. Interesting guy here. There aren't all that many players in Major League Baseball history that have come from Brazil. And that is where Orlando is from. In fact, he played for Barry Larkin in the World Games. Very speedy outfielder. Spent nine years in the minor leagues before he got his first taste of the big leagues. And, and he helped them win a lot of games last year. Runs extremely well. Strikes out a lot. One of the few Royals that will strike out a lot. And like many of his teammates, he rarely, if ever, will draw a walk. One and two. Royals under the general manager Dayton Moore, who for many, many years worked under John Shearholtz in Atlanta, really putting together a blueprint of how to build an organization. And while they haven't built the pitching, the Braves did. When they had Maddox and Smoltz and Flavin and all that kind of thing. But they certainly have done it position player wise, and they believe maybe, maybe, some of those young pitchers can put it all together this year. Well, they've certainly done the pitching standpoint well from the bullpen aspect. 
really well. Inning over. Nice pitch. Royals come up with a couple of hits in a run. They strand it to Billy Hamilton to lead it off when we come back. Hi, checking out the RAV4? Yep, looking for something fun. Well, with available sport tuning. Beautiful day in Goodyear, Arizona. Let's take a look at who's going to show up for the first time in a game this year. And that's Billy Hamilton. Coming off that shoulder injury and subsequent surgery, he will lead things off. Take a look at the Reds' starting lineup behind Hamilton. It will be the DH today. Mozart and Bottle to follow. Duval, Bruce, Peraza. Latter third of Scott Shevlin, Yvonne Jesus Jr., Ramon Cabrera. Against a veteran right-handed. Saw him for a number of years with Arizona after originally coming up for the Yankees. Spent the last two years in San Diego is Ian Kennedy. Hamilton lays one down. You can just stick it in your pocket. That's what we're hoping to see more of this season. Well, speed is just something you can't teach, especially Billy Hamilton's speed. He lays this ball down, and it looks like it's going right back towards the pitcher's mound. It wasn't angled off to either base. Watch where this ball ends up. Kennedy just a little bit stutter step coming off the mound, and he's thinking, I'm likely to throw it down the right field line if I cut this one loose. So Hamilton leads it off with a base hit. Zach Kozart first pitch swinging, drives one down into the corner, and it's caught, tagging up, alert base running there by Billy Hamilton to get into scoring position. Two pitches, a runner at second and one out. Okay, another thing the Royals do as well as anybody in the game, and that's play defense. They are rock solid virtually everywhere. So now Joey Votto. You know, Chris, we brought up earlier about Kansas City, a team that rarely ever walks. Of course, Joey Votto is the walking man. Votto walked 143 times last year. Mm -hmm. The Royals walked 383 as, as a, a team? team. Wow. Uh, different ways to get it done. I mean, Votto's approach is essentially telling everybody, my job up there as a batter is simply not to make an out. Mm -hmm. And he's one of the best in the business at doing that. He sure is. He's had an outstanding spring. Seven hits, 19 at bats. It's a 368 out. And even a lot of the balls that he's made outs on have been rockets. Just hits the ball hard. 3-0, he's not afraid to cut it loose, 
That one was nowhere near the plate, and they'll take the walk. Two on, one out for Adam Newell. Kennedy, a highly touted prospect for the Yankees coming out of USC. He had a monster year for the Diamondbacks in 2011 when they went to the playoffs. 21-4. and four. And really, ever since then, he's a guy that you can pretty much count on 200-plus innings. He'll win anywhere, or he has since anywhere, from 9 to 15. Last year, a 9 and 15 win-loss record. Did not have a good year. When you pitch in San Diego and that ERA is over 4, that's not a good year. But, oh, the magic of pitching in 2015 and 2016. That 9 and 15 record. At the half of the Padres last year. Hamilton going to take third. That earned Ian Kennedy the second largest free agent contract ever given out by the Kansas City Royals. A $70 million deal. The only one to eclipse that was a $72 million deal that the Royals have now with Alex Gordon. 9 and 15. Well, it's good work, my friend, if you can get it. That's a nice piece of hitting right there by Duval. Just punching one through the hole in the right field to play Hamilton. And boy, the speed of Hamilton just in this half inning alone. On hit, tag up, go to third on a wild pitch, score. That is a good bit of hitting right there. You really wonder how much action Adam Duval will get against right-handed pitching. I mean, there's a plan right now in place. It's not formal or written or even decided upon, but they're thinking about maybe Duvall and Scott Shevler being lefty righty platoons out in left field. A little bit of hitting like that against a right-hander can do you some good. So a 1-1 game, and Jay Bruce the batter with Votto at second base, and Duvall with the RBI over at first. Last time you and I were on the air, the first two games of this spring, we were about a day or two removed from the rumor that Jay Bruce was going to be traded to Toronto. Obviously, that never happened. And you really haven't heard any talk about any other deal in the works for Jay Bruce. Doesn't mean it's not there. Just haven't heard anything about it. What are you getting? Towards the time of the spring where teams are beginning to figure out ways to shed players off their roster rather than add more. So if you're thinking, well, if teams are, have a, a number of young players, for instance, that they could be out of options on or uh, need to move one way or another, you know, that may make it more ripe here towards the end of spring training to see some trades. Although really... If you evaluate the whole thing and boil it down, you figure, I mean, if the Reds have not been able to get a deal yet that they like to trade Jay Bruce, we may not see one, at least until sometime this summer. And obviously the Reds want Bruce to play well. I mean, it would make them a much better team if we see the same Jay Bruce we saw, you know, really two and a half years ago rather than necessarily each of the last two years. One, because you play well, and two, the asking price goes up. Mm -hmm. Reds do have a, a team option on Jay Bruce's contract for another year at a very, very good price. That ball is smacked into right center field. That'll go to the warning track, cut off by Orlando. One run in. They're going to hold Duval. The Reds have a two to one lead over Ian Kennedy. Looks like both these teams had their hitting shoes on this afternoon. A little hanging breaking ball, thigh high, center cut for Jay Bruce, and he lines it in the gap. Well, here's a young fellow we talked about before this one ever got started, and that is Jose Peraza. Traded twice within six months. Atlanta to the Dodgers, Dodgers to the Reds. And a Todd Frazier three-team deal. He is only 21 years young. And I turn 22 until the end of next month. 
See the numbers from Triple A last year in five minor league seasons. He is a 302 hitter with an on base percentage of up over 340. Yesterday, Brian Price played Peraza for the first time this spring as a starter in center field. I mean, let's face it, today is the first game Billy Hamilton has been in the lineup because of that shoulder surgery. He has still not played in the outfield. Now, remember that shoulder surgery for Hamilton was on his throwing arm. So he set back a little bit from that standpoint, but assured me he thought he'd be ready for the opening of the season. It's a good change up there and a needed one by Kennedy. Two away. Two runs, three hits for the Reds. One run, two hits for the Royals. Bottom of the first inning. And here is Shevlin. Another former Dodger farmhand. Got his first taste of AAA and the major leagues did Shevlin last year. Played in 19 games with a big league club and hit three home runs. The M.O. on this guy, or at least the word is, and Chris, we've seen it already this spring. Tremendous power from this native Iowa. Yeah, and a short swing. A good, quick bat to the ball. I think he's almost a mirror image of Adam Duvall. They're built the same. They have very similar swings. They both have some power. Shortstop backs up, squeezes it tightly to end the inning, but a good start for the Red Legs. It began with Billy setting the table in a two-run first inning and a one-run lead. Everything you've come to expect and more new low price for this year. Watch every out-of-market game of all 30 teams live in True HD on over 400 supported devices. Blackout and other restrictions apply. Visit MLB.tv for details. 2-1 ball game. Reds lead for the second inning. Omar and Fonte have been around a long time. Looks at a strike from Brandon Finnegan. ago this Royals team payroll was 39 million dollars and the owner was being raked over the coals by fans and and those in the local press in fact they were being roasted nationally 
We're just not spending any money. Dave Moore, the general manager, had an offer to become the general manager of the Boston Red Sox. He went to the owner of the Royals and said, well, what do we want to do? The owner said, you do whatever you want to do to get us to win a championship. That one blistered right by Dave Hastings Jr. into center field by Infante. We saw this Royals team during the regular season last year, Chris, and here we are in the second inning today. And I recall vividly when we were in Kansas City last year, there was something different about the ball just coming off the sound of the bat from some of their hits. And boy, they have hit some balls so hard already again here today. Yeah, they have. You know, Tom, I think a lot of it also is attitude. This is the ball club that is preparing this spring to win ball games. They're not trying to figure out who's going to be on the team. They're not uh, trying to educate players or teach players, you know, the nuances of the game, which is the task at hand for Brian Price and his coaching staff. I mean, it's essentially school for the Reds. Or the Royals, on the other hand, are thinking, how do we get back to the World Series? How can we build chemistry? What can one guy teach another guy about raising his game just a little bit? And they do swing the bat. And I think when you get on a ball club like that, that has won the last couple of years, you have a little bit of peer pressure. You have this internal competition going on. And there's nothing better for any team in any sport than having internal competition to push your teammate to be the best. In the air left field, it'll be handled by Shevlin. One out of the inning, and Infante will stay put at first base. And that internal competition is not the same as me versus you for that last roster spot. It's already guys who have assured jobs on the team pushing the guy across the infield to be just a little bit better so I can be a little bit better. You know, we were talking with some of the Kansas City folks before the game today and we talked about this a little bit last year when the Reds were in Kansas City. Tony Cruz about it. And he looks at a strike. We've seen Cruz his entire career with the Cardinals. Came up with a big league club in 2011. And in each of the last six years has played for the major league team. Backing up Yadier Molina. But it's so fascinating when you actually look back on the Reds in very similar fashion to the Royals. A lot of very good young players coming together at the same time, getting their taste of the playoffs. Reds in 2010 swept by a really good Philadelphia team. 2012 having the two games to none lead over the Giants. Losing three in a row at home. And then, of course, 13 losing the one-game playoff to the Pirates. The Royals had not been to the postseason in 29 years. When they got their chance in 2014, it was in the one-game playoff. They were losing to the Oakland A's, who had been a far better team during the regular season, by four runs in the seventh inning. They came back to win the game. There's a double play. We'll get back to this when we return. A hit done well. Middle of the second. 2 1 red.
Patrick's Day right around the corner. Mr. Welch coming up a couple of days. Started the NCAA basketball tournament. What about that combination? St. Patrick's Day, the day the basketball tournament starts. Doesn't get any better now. You're right about that. That's more than a coincidence, I think. I think you're right. So you go with all the teams that are dressed in green on the first day, I presume. It's probably not a bad idea. I have uh, not had a chance to sit down and really look at a bracket or any of that kind of thing. That ball is hammered by De Jesus Jr. in the left field. And he's coming into second base where he is tagged out. What well, we talked about the defense and one of the best in all of baseball, maybe the best, is Alex Gordon, who just threw him out. And he was all the way in the deepest part of that ballpark down there, tucked into the left field corner. The Hayshoots hits it hard and he's taken off the bat. Most of the time when I get it down to the right field or left field corner, that's going to be a double. But Gordon gets over there, cuts it off right at the track and throws it on one hop out. Went away in the inning and now Ramon Cabrera. Getting a chance to start behind the plate today. Brian Price once again confirming that still according to the plan. Devin Mezzarocco, who made just nine starts, played in 14 games last year, then underwent hip surgery, will start behind the plate day after tomorrow. First time he will catch and play in a game this spring. So everybody is anticipating seeing Mezzarocco get through that, Chris, and Full speed ahead, moving forward. No doubt, Tom. That's one thing that everybody's been waiting for. I mean, most of all, Devin Mezzarocco. I mean, until you get him back and playing as he can play, there's going to be a hole in this lineup. I mean, he was essentially signed to a long-term deal because he was a middle-of-the-order type hitter. He's come through the organization, former number one pick out of high school the Reds had. And, you know, to be sidelined by that hip injury, which really came out of nowhere. Uh, something I think that threw everybody for a loop. Hamilton, a bunt hit leading off the first inning. Advances second on a fly ball, and now he turns on one and hits it a ton down the right field line. Orlando up against the wall will make the catch to end the inning. We play two. Reds lead the Royals two to one. I just got a chance to talk to Red's new pitching coach, Mark Riggins. So many on the outside would think this is a big challenge coming in here with so many young pitchers. But on the flip side, I ask him, is it exciting to be able to put your stamp on some young players? Yeah, it is very exciting. It's a little different than where I was in Chicago in 11. More development part, uh, more teaching, which I love to do with the young guys. They've been re very receptive to me and 
we, we're having some fun. You know, it's a great little group to mold right here the way we want a Cincinnati Red to be. And speaking of challenges, you also come into a new rule. You've got a 30-second clock to make a trip to the mound, so you had better keep your running shoes on. Yeah, I, I, I jog in, at nighttime a little bit just to make sure I can run out there and get back in in 30 seconds. <laughs> Appreciate your time. All right, take care. Jim, Mark, thank you very much. First year as a major league pitching coach for the Reds for Mark Riggins spent the last four years as a minor league pitching coordinator. A player development position he also held with the Cubs for three years and Cardinals for 11. He did have one year stint as a major league pitching coach for the Cardinals in 95 and the Cubs in 2011. Escobar gone swinging against Finnegan to begin the third. Second strikeout for Brandon. Reds lead two to one. Took a little bit off that pitch. Nice change up. And that's the pitch we were talking about. The third of his three pitch arsenal. He'll also throw some variations of breaking balls. I don't want to say he's only a three pitch pitcher. That's a quality change up. Riggins, uh, a guy that was born in Jasper, Indiana. Of course, that's the home of Scott Rowland as well. And Went to Murray State. I had previously said he had gone to Moorhead State, but it was really Murray State. All of those areas, Murray State, Jasper, all Reds country. Now, when you think about Indiana, I mean, even though you mentioned, you know, Scott Rowland, the first thing you think of in Indiana, look at this. Knocked his glove clean off, and they still get the out. That is an excellent play by Adam Duval. Well, he doesn't throw his glove at that ball. He just has it on the end of his hand, it looks like. And when it tips the top of it, it takes it off his hand. And Duval is there to make the one-handed pick up and throw. Now, if you throw the, the, the glove at the ball, and you make contact with the batted ball, that's a three-base penalty. So that batter would end up on third base. So two down in the inning for Finnegan, and now he'll face Morales, who bounced out on the fielder's choice his first time up. Oh, my gosh. Now, that did knock it off. And he throws him out, and now all of a sudden he's looking at that right hand. Not his pitching hand, obviously. But that was a bullet back to the mound. Let's take a look. That's scary stuff. Hopefully he's all right. about it still taking a look at that glove hand he may want to borrow a little padding from Ramon Cabrera and stick it in the no. palm of that glove huh? I think he ought to borrow your idea you just told a story in between <laughs> innings 
that must be repeated. This is an unbelievable story. I, I was in the minor leagues and I got hit with a, a one hopper back to the mound. Now back up a minute now. Okay. You're 31 years I'm old. I'm 31 years old. I'm playing in Oklahoma City for the Texas Rangers organization. And I'm on my last gasp. And now I, I get hit with a line drive that hits me right above where the glove line is, but on the thumb area. There's a little bump on your thumb. Well, it broke that little bump. So I go to the doctor, and sure enough, the x-ray, and it's broken, and they say, you're going to be out of mind. And I'm like, no, I, 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 it's April. I'm 31 years old. I cannot be out of mind. I, I mean, I'm either playing or going home. And they said, well, there's no other way around it. So we went to the doctor, went, went to see like a prosthetic specialist who, you know, work on different things, medical instruments and so on. I gave him my glove and he, I said, unlace this and put some kind of padding on there so I can wear my glove and it would still protect my thumb so it doesn't have any more damage. So he did, he, they did that. They had a kind of like a vinyl uh, thing that came out like a flap. I had to get it approved by the umpires before the game, but I essentially had to strap that glove on my hand and wear it around the whole game. I couldn't take the glove off once it was strapped on. Couldn't rub a ball up, really couldn't do anything. The DH was in effect. And uh, ended up pitching, I think, three starts like that. And I didn't like it because I liked to rub the ball up and couldn't do it with just one hand. And finally, I got permission to take the glove off. Uh, that night, I pitched a one-hitter and got called up to the big leagues. That's amazing. Day. Great story. Great, great story. But it's no fun getting hit with balls that come back at you. And they, you know, anybody who was down in spring training a couple of years ago may have been at that night game when the Royals and the Reds were squared off and the oldest chapter was hit by a line drive from the Royals catcher, Salvador Perez. I know that more than a few people were thinking about when they saw that ball go back to Brandon Finnegan. Well, it looked like when that ball came off the bat a moment ago, Morales, it looked like it it may have hit Finnegan in the exact area that you're talking about, right where that glove tends to, you know, move closer to the fingers once it starts sliding up and down a little bit. Two and two to Joey Votto. You know, when you wear the glove, it, it, it do, you do have the upper part of your palm exposed a little bit. This is the part of the at-bat. I, I really like watching Bob. I mean, you know, they got two strikes on him. He chokes up a little bit, and now he taps the plate, and he says, all right, now down to business. And you wonder, does Kennedy have the stuff to put him away? He does there are certain at-bats in certain pitchers and situations. It's not to say that the pitcher can't get the hitter out or maybe the hitter gets himself out. But Kennedy just doesn't have the stuff to put Votto away. No, but I think Kennedy, you know, at his age now, realizes that he doesn't have the stuff to put a lot of people away. He only has to present a pitch to give the hitter his best opportunity to get himself out. And that's really good advice from any pitching coach because very few guys can just rear back and just overpower hitters with whatever stuff they've got. You make good pitches, for the most part, you're going to get most everybody out. Bottle may be one of the exceptions. Duval, the run scoring single to get the Reds on the board in the first inning. They would tack on one more run, and that's where we stand here at the bottom of the third. Two to one Reds. Ball stung to the pull side. Duval, two out of two. I was reminded to finish one thing we were talking about, Mark Riggins. I had never seen the movie Hoosiers until two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I'm at home and we put it on with the kids. Holly and I are sitting there with Ellen Luke, and we decide we're going to watch Hoosiers. Mark Riggins, when he was playing high school basketball, in 1975, they went to the state championship in Indiana. Now, brother, 
state championship is big in any sport but in indiana and kentucky especially that is quite an event what a movie that is <laughs> i'd say to friends believe. i can't believe you know, you're, you're getting ready yeah, to say i can't I, believe you've never seen that exactly. and, and i'm like you know what i, I can't believe it either but my, oh my, was that exciting. And I was just in Indianapolis for the Big Ten Tournament on Friday. Mm -hmm. And in that beautiful arena they have there, the downtown Indy, the home of the Pacers. They have this huge mural, a picture of that team from Milan, Indiana. Yeah. You know, we see clips of that movie, the very end, you know, oh, yeah. in, the, in, the, in the locker room and they're clapping. At different ballparks around sure the, both leagues where you know you're trying to get the crowd into maybe a ninth inning rally for the home team and they'll play that clip and everybody starts to clap and get all fired up Kennedy gonna take the out at first base the other two advance motto to third and Duval to second two away in the inning. so now another chance this time with two men out for Parazzi Second and third and struck out his first time up. Ten hits in his last 16 at bats coming into play today for Jose Parazzo. Ball one. Brian Price was asked a question before the game today about Dufall and playing him down at third. Follow-up question, well, who would be your primary utility guy, backup kind of player for different spots around the infield? And naturally, he says, Yvonne De Jesus Jr. The follow-up question to that, does Peraza have a chance to play himself into that role for the big league club? Popped up to the right side, should in the inning. And Price's answer was... Would it get him enough at bats and playing time to make it work? That's all he would say. Special stop on the road trip to opening day tomorrow over at Skyline and Fairfield. That's at 7105 Dixie Highway. Be there for lunch and win great prizes. Talk Reds baseball with us tomorrow at noon. I believe that's the brand new Skyline. I was just here a couple of weeks ago after an indoor lacrosse game on a Friday night. If it's the same one, that's the nicest Skyline I've ever been in. And there are a lot of newer ones around town. This one is incredible how nice it is. Mm. 
and you hunker down. We saw Sean Casey. He was here today for the MLB Network. All he wanted to talk about was Skyline Chip. <laughs> MLB Network in town today. Casey and his running mate, uh, Matt Beskirchen. A lot of laughs with that duo down at the Reds Complex about a half a mile, quarter mile down the road. Finnegan against Morales. Leading off the fourth, Brandon allowed a run on two hits to the first three batters of the game. He is not allowed a hit since. Or only one hit since, I beg your pardon. No run. Threw that one right by Morales, a fastball and a 3-1 count. And this guy can hit. Some guys are low ball pitchers, other pitchers are high ball pitchers. And Finnegan is one of those guys, I think, Tom, that can get by throwing the ball effectively up in the zone. A four seamer that doesn't really sink very much. He's not really tall, doesn't have a lot of downward arc on his pitching delivery. And you're gonna see him have a lot of foul balls straight back because that's the way he, he can get things done. Breaking ball, hooked foul. Nice play out there. Now the breaking ball needs to be down. Yeah, that was a one-handed grab. Perfect spot. A lot of blue in the stands here today. Now that deserves a high five. Bruce to his glove side for out number one. the Kansas City Royal the Royals uh, complex up in surprise only about 20 minutes from here that is a complex a share which is uh, with the Texas Rangers you did the game on radio yesterday over in Tempe where the angels are that's a nice setting there Beautiful and that setting. big kind of rock mountain in the mm -hmm. left field line well i think every now and again a lot of us i remember it as a little kid and i'm sure that uh, somebody from time to time will see a, a telecast of an arizona state university football game mm -hmm. and you see that huge mountain attached yeah. to the stadium in the north end zone well they have a similar couple of Mick Mountains they call them out here you know they're just little small rock formations not so small but not certainly like Camelback Mountain or you know a Squaw Peak that they have here nothing like that but they have that stadium the Angel Stadium built right into the side of one of those small mountains and they have a beautiful hotel which is also attached to it Cool setup over there. It's called the Butte, isn't it? The Butte. The Buttes, yeah. One of the highlights of spring training in Arizona every year is that is the venue for the Gene Autry Courage Awards, where just incredible athletic accomplishments and those that perform them are honored every year. Of course, Gene Autry, many of you know him as the old, uh, what, singing cowboy, right? From movies and TV, who also happened to own the Angels for a long, long time. 3-2 on Gordon. Got him swinging. Didn't look like that did a whole lot, but it sort of stayed in the spot where Gordon didn't get it. Looked like a little breaking ball. I couldn't tell from just up here in the third level how much it broke. And it hung up there probably a little more than he wanted. But he, Gordon kind of handcuffed himself on that. He picks up a strikeout. Three strikeouts now for Finnegan. 
has not walked a batter. That's a like that ratio. And he's retired seven in a row. Yeah, the way these two teams came out in the first inning, I thought it was going to be a slugfest. So now Orlando, he struck out swinging, ending the Kansas City first inning. All the runs in this game came in the first. Royals with one, the Reds had a pair. Finnegan trying to become just a second Reds pitcher this spring, the other being Dee Sclafani to get through four full innings on the mound. They gave Tim Melville that chance yesterday, and he was removed one out into his fourth inning. He ran out of gas, it looked yeah. like. And then the gas came in from the bullpen. Rough game yesterday for Jumbo Diaz. Very ugly. That's a bullet by Orlando right to Kozar. Four strong innings today for Finnegan. Gives up one run. Well, they run him out there for a fifth today. My pleasure to welcome in catcher Devin Mezzarocco. Now, Brian Price, the manager, gave us some exciting news this morning. He says on the 17th, in a couple days, you will make your spring training debut, and it will be behind the plate. you got to be chomping at the bit for this. Definitely, yeah. It's been a long time coming. You know, a lot of hard work, a lot of credit to the, to the training staff here that's really, you know, worked hard to get me to where I am. And Definitely looking forward to it. He came to camp after hip surgery, full go, and then a little bit of a setback. Can you explain to fans what that setback was? Well, I had a little bit of tightness in my groin and hip flexor area. You know, I have a lot more range of motion than what I ever had. So that's something that was somewhat expected. Uh, we talked to the, the doctors, and they said, you know, not a big deal. Take a couple of days and get it right, and then you'll get back out there. Until you test it in game action over a long period of time, is there any lingering doubt that this might be a long-term thing for you? Is there any of that in your head right now? No, no. I think that, you know, once once everything got fixed in there, uh, everything's fine. You know, I just have to be able to go out there, build myself up, you know, catching multiple innings, and, and everything should be perfectly fine. Well, I hope we get to a point where we're no longer asking you about your hip because I know you're probably getting tired of it, but looking forward to... Uh, perhaps hitting in the middle of the lineup this season for many, many games. Definitely. You know, I, I uh, did plenty of watching, so I want to be out there. I want to be out there uh, helping the guys out behind the plate, helping the guys out in the batter's box, and, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, getting it started. Appreciate your time, Devin. Thanks. Two days, boys. Devin Mezzarocco will make his spring training debut, and it will not be easing him in. He'll be behind the plate. Yes, indeed. The puck to Tony, Pennsylvania. Native number one draft pick of the Reds back in 2007. Was last healthy, and you can't even say fully healthy because that year he did not play a full year. In 2014, when he went to the All Star game, 25 home runs, knocked in 80. 
And Mezzarocco did all that damage in just 114 games. Shevlin, meanwhile, gone on strikes to begin this bottom of the fourth with the Reds leading 2-1. to one. You know, until Devin Mezzarocco can show the Reds that he can catch, you know, say three or four days out of the week, the Reds have to wonder how they're going to make up their roster because whether... You know, whether he, if he can't play enough, it could be that they need to carry a third catcher to start the season. And, or somebody who could catch in an emergency, like a Jordan Pacheco, one reason why he's an interesting guy in camp. Ramon Cabrera gets a chance to catch today. Of course, the fallback guy is Tucker Barnhart. He's having a, a nice spring. His pitchers like throwing to him. Say Jesus tried to turn a single into a double, was thrown out by Alex Gordon in the second inning. Ian Kennedy, a two and one count on De Jesus. You know, the Reds didn't have a lot of you know positive things come out of a 98 loss season as he is grazed with that pitch from Kennedy. And De Jesus will take first base. De Jesus would have certainly been a pleasant surprise last year. I think for the ball club and for him. I mean, there was a time last year that had he not made the team last year, he might not be even in baseball anymore. I mean, you get to a point where, you know, you go to camp and you get cut and you get called up and you get cut again and you get taken off the roster and you become a free agent, minor league player, and you're just looking for a look-see somewhere. And you take whatever you can get, it just wears you out. And you come to the point, well, well, maybe it's just time for me to get on with my life. Well, last year, Yvonne made a, the right decision to come to camp and, and gut it out because here he is, the main utility infielder for this Reds team. Well, he's not going to run on Gordon again. That was a hit and run, but Gordon closing quickly on that little flare, a base hit in the left field by Cabrera. And the Reds have two on, going back to the top of the order here in the fourth. Let's go back to that first inning, and this is what Reds fans are really hoping, Chris, we see more of. Put the ball in play, even with a bunt like that. Not a great bunt, but good enough not even to draw a throw. Tags up on a foul ball down the right field line from first to second. When you get a pass ball, you move over to third base easily enough, and it comes around to score. Hamilton drove the ball to the wall and right field is next time up. So here's his third go round strike one. You know, you look at that fly ball to ground ball ratio on some hitters and you never even look at it a second time. Doesn't matter. For guys that run like Hamilton runs and he infrequently walks. You take a long, hard look at that ratio. And basically, Chris, by and large, for every ground ball he hit, he hit a fly ball. Yeah, and, and he doesn't have the kind of fly ball power. I mean, there are some hitters that you want to see more fly balls than ground sure. balls. And Hamilton's not that kind of hitter. Um, you want sluggers to get the ball in the air, not on the ground. Hamilton, you don't want him swinging at pitches that are above the waist until he gets two strikes on him. Simple as that. But I think even more important for Billy, and I've had a couple of conversations with him about it. He, you know, he's just trying to simplify things this year. He's not trying to hit everything to left field. He's just trying to put the ball in play, get his swing path to the ball quicker. And, of course, you have to get over some injuries, too. The reason he hasn't played is because when he follows through left-handed batting, it, it aggravates that shoulder that he had repaired. Well, there's another fly ball. And it's a second down of the inning. He worked all winter long with Billy Hatcher in Cincinnati, stayed around Cincinnati. Took a lot of batting practice at the Reds Urban Youth Academy. Went down to the Reds ballpark a lot, worked with Hatcher just about every day. That and trying to rehab his shoulder. So one thing that's different, I think, for Billy Hamilton this year is that with Jose Peraza getting some playing time in center field, you've got somebody, you've got a plan B that's going to push Billy a little bit. And that's sometimes what a guy needs. Right. 
Zach Cozart over two is fly to right and grounded out to shortstop. As many of you remember, Cozart had a dreadful offensive season in 2014. Hit 220, four home runs, playing virtually every day. Had 38 runs batted in. And there were a lot of fans around Cincinnati saying the Reds need a new shortstop. He was off to a great start last year before the injury. And we're going to hear from Brian Price on having Cozart back when we return. We missed him a lot last year, starting in early June for the rest of the season. And, uh, you know, his not just his defense, but his, his uh, this is overall attitude about love and being a red and, and bringing the right attitude for all these young guys to, to emulate is important for us. So we'll see if Kozar can come all the way back. He'd been waiting and waiting. I mean, he'd been really waiting, hoping to get in there. And finally, last Friday was a day he had a chance to get into the lineup. And he's building himself up. He's not playing as long as the other regulars. In fact, he's been lifted from the game. Blake Trahan takes over at shortstop. And Finnegan is out there, Chris, for a fifth inning, trying to become the first Reds pitcher to go longer than four frames. Yeah, he's throwing the ball very well. Yeah, he has thrown the well. He has had a couple of easy innings, as you mentioned, the number of batters he's retired in a row. He's also the kind of pitcher that says, well, I'm not coming out. Are you kidding? I'm feeling good. You know, he reminds me a little bit. I'm rolling the clock back here, Tom, but he reminds me a little bit of Don Gullett. Same type of delivery. He's got a high effort delivery. Throws a little across his body. I mean, Gullett in his era may have thrown harder than Brandon does now. But he's got that same bulldog mentality. I mean, I really love the way he competes. That was a pretty good-looking breaking ball right there. He thought that should have been called a strike. Sometimes you can fool the umpire. I mean, at some point, that didn't cross the plate. That thing had enough break to cross a river. And that one banged into center field by Infante, his second hit. J.J. Hoover has been up and throwing in each of the last two innings. And he's throwing again. Check in downstairs. Is it Joey Votto down there? No, I'm sorry. Zach Kozart standing by now with Jim Day. Tom, thank you very much. Uh, Zach comes out after four innings. First of all, that's by design, right? Yeah. I mean, it's spring training. Right? I've only, this is my, what, third game. Yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't know a lot of people expecting me to play nine. So, right. 
Uh, yeah, th good news is feel great. Feel normal. Feel like a normal guy. I don't. I feel like I could go out there and play nine. I feel great. So um, it's just good to you know get three at bats, see some pitching, face, see a guy that you know I've faced a lot. No, and um, it's uh, I feel good. After three games, uh, you've pretty much tested every aspect. One, you've hit it out of the ballpark, has a couple diving plays. Uh, pretty much tested that knee in every aspect, have you not? Yeah, we uh, we joke around about our, our little checkbook we have. It's like check here, check that, you know, touching a base, stuff like that. Uh, but yeah, I, like I said, I I have no issues. I'm, I'm, I feel 100%. Now it's just a matter of getting, you know, my timing down, getting a lot of at-bats and um, getting out there on defense. So, um, you know, I've, I, I'm, I'm pretty happy where I'm at right now, that's for sure. Do you have any limitations at all with that brace? I don't think so. Um, obviously, I feel it there, but um, I feel like I'm moving good out there and side to side, and um, that's kind of my judge. You know, um, if I can go quick side to side at shortstop, I'll be just fine. Well, we appreciate your time and so glad that it's going well. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. As that goes, our boys, all is well. We'll keep our fingers crossed on that one. Yes, we will, Jim. Thank you very much. Now, Jim, the last game we had on television, you had a, a, an interview that was really for the ages. I mean, there was so much national response to your chat down there uh, with your buddy Joey Votto. You guys seem to have a lot of fun with one another. Are, is there going to be an encore performance today? There will not be an encore performance today because uh, once he leaves the ball game, he will probably hightail it out of here. So we'll have to... Maybe save that for somewhere down there. Well, we'll see about that. I mean, uh, he might come down there for you one more time. That'd be well, fine. I don't know. He said his goal was to do as least amount of interviews as possible. So. Yeah, but, man, he, he, he saved that doozy for you that day. I know. Yeah. I walked right into it. For those of you that weren't with us, uh, you know, they got near the end of the interview, or at least what Chip thought was near the end of the interview. And uh, what did he say to you, Jim? He said, aren't you going to try and make me cry? Yeah, he said, uh, was that it? Uh, wow, I thought you were going to ask me some personal probing questions that make me cry. And I kind of caught me off guard. I definitely don't want to make no, you no, cry. No, I didn't, no, 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 you didn't miss a beat. You said, well, you can cry if you'd like to. <laughs> oh, you know what? It was it's a long, really funny <laughs> interview. It's a long spring camp. <laughs> You've been out here the whole time. Indeed. And no complaints. Well, Jim, will you be heading over to the sponsors' dinner tonight after the ball game? I will not. A lot, this a, lot is the, a lot of the red sponsors are down. Tom, I know you're headed over. I'm heading home, unfortunately. But uh, this is big sponsors' week down here. Yes, it is. Bill Reinberger has herded up all the main sponsors the Reds have had, including our own Trey Dolly, who runs the the sales ship for the Reds there in Cincinnati and Fox Sports. They're out in the uh, party deck out there in right field. Mr. Castellini uh, meeting and greeting all those who we certainly can't thank them enough. Both the Reds and on Fox Sports Ohio for spending their money advertising their businesses on Reds baseball. Check swing at a foul ball. And a lot of those sponsors are also TV sponsors. Cincinnati Bell, right. Montgomery Inn. We thank them for their, their sponsorship. A lot of them have been with the Reds a long time. Anheuser-Busch, Cowboys favorite Coca-Cola. Cowboys down around the Grand Canyon somewhere, is he not? Yes, he is. His family out on spring break, kids out on spring break, so he went there for the first time. Runner goes, swing and a miss, and a throw is not in time. Four strikeout for Finnegan. One away with the Reds leading 2-1 to one here in the fifth. Tough pitch to handle down in the dirt with the runner going, and Cabrera gets it off. Kind of a funky slide here at the very end. It's a delayed steal, or maybe he was just going thinking that ball was just going to be in the dirt. So it looks like Brandon may have reached his pitch count. Brian Price has made his way out to the mound. Relieve him of his duties and make a call in the bullpen. Well, I think it's safe to say, Chris, as he walks off, this young man is pitching himself into the starting rotation. I don't think there's any doubt about it, Tom. I thought he had an inside track when he came to camp. And I think just the way he has taken control of his outings uh, indicate to me he's going to be one of the five when we break camp. Four hits.
points in four and a third, one run so far. A good outing for the former Royal, Brandon Finnegan. Reds two, Royals one. Tying run out at second base and taking over for Brandon Finnegan to face Tony Cruz, a man who more than likely will get a chance to close things out for the Reds for the first time this year. And that's J.J. Hoover. He takes care of Cruz two away, tying run on to third. I know this has got to be an exciting camp for J.J. Hoover because who would have thought for J.J. just a couple of years ago that he would be in the position where he would be really one of the elder statesmen of all the pitchers the Reds have in their bullpen. With all the different options, J.J. has five major league saves. And he has looked right, right now to be the closer. Those five saves have come over his parts of four major league seasons. Mm -hmm. You know, you can name on one hand the number of players around Major League Baseball who would even try this. Because if you laid that bunt down and went right back to the pitcher, you know, you stand to, to get a lot of criticism. Maybe from teammates, coach perhaps. Why are you bunting when you got a guy at third base? Drive that guy in. But when it works, boy, does it look like a pretty play. So a 2-2 two -two game here in the fifth inning, and now Boustakis will the go-ahead run at first. He is 0 for 2, has bounced to the mound and struck out. Or J.J. really turned his season around from one year to the next. 2014 had just a horrendous year. He was 1-10, and 10, earned run average up around 5. Last year, he won 8, lost 2 in 67 games. Earned run average came down just about half of what it was the year before. Got a much better grip on his breaking ball through it more consistently. Gave up only 44 hits in 64 innings. Now the Reds certainly going to miss a roll to Chapman, but somebody's got to take the spot in the ninth inning. Two and zero on Mike Moustakis and Hoover a glance over his shoulder, and it's ball three. We talk about huge shoes to fill. 
for anybody. I mean, could they be any bigger? No, they can't. No closer in baseball would it be bigger than him. The most dominant pitcher maybe in the history, not necessarily from a save standpoint, but just the the circus atmosphere, the theatrics of when he would they would bring him in a ball game. I mean, you're wondering if this is the night he's going to throw 105 miles an hour. It'll be a little different around the ninth inning. It's a nice play by Trahan. That's a shortstop. Playing on the first base side of second. Boyle's time again. 2-2 after four and a half. Frisch's big boy arrive early, enjoy the pregame kids block party, and we're talking about the kids opening day now. That's the first Sunday of the year on April the 10th. We've got interactive games. You can walk the red carpet in the fan zone. Kids 14 and younger get a red cap thanks to Frisch's big boy. 5133 and one REDS. Visit select program locations or log on to reds.com. Kids opening day. First time we've ever done it. You know, we have opening day, opening day, the opening day. Then you have opening night, which has turned into a really cool deal. And Tuxedos. now a kids opening day. I love it. I mean, the Reds do so much for kids. All throughout the community, the community fund has re they've refurbished so many different baseball fields and softball fields out there. They've got great kids activities down the right field line, the kids zones and all that. Looking forward to that. I don't know how many guys are looking forward to facing Wade Davis. But certainly not Joey Votto. Because Joey Votto faced him last year when the Reds were in Kansas City. And if you ask Joey Votto, this may be a good question for Jim Day to ask him in a, some upcoming interview whenever he's Maybe able to get him. Uh, you know, what was the best pitch you saw all year last year? And Joey Votto will tell you it was a 96-mile-an-hour cutter that he faced from Wade Davis. And he probably spent all winter long thinking about that pitch. At that time, he unjammed it down the right field line. Yeah, he says, take that. Boy, that is quick to the ball. And, you know, you go back, and we'll, we'll show you that exact angle on that swing again. And for those of you that coach Little League Baseball, maybe your youngsters playing Major League Baseball, and Chris, you know this, with your sons and daughters growing up playing baseball, softball, you know, you see so many kids now, you know, striding forward, you know, maybe too far in their stride with their front foot. Mm -hmm. Look at Votto, all he's doing is picking it up and putting it right back down while, of course, shifting the weight. 
Well, for Botto, that is a product of repetition. Should be out number one here in the Reds' fifth. Yeah. I think it was during one of the early Reds' fests when Joey Botto was around. I asked him, what did you do as a kid? to make your swing major league ready. And watch, you, you pick it up, you put it down, and maybe he strides out an inch or two. But what he really does is keeps his head back and perfectly still. Your best chance of hitting baseball is when your head is still. And that's what he does as well as anybody. And he said, you know, I, he lived in Canada. He would go into his basement at night with a baseball bat and swing that bat several hundred times a night. No batting tee, no cage, no indoor baseball training facility, no hitting guru at his side, flipping him pitches by himself, swinging the bat time after time after time. I think it turned out pretty well for him. Well, I mean, you have to get to Bill Milan. You have to be able to get that, that brain to send messages to your hand as fast as possible so when you recognize the pitch, you can turn on it. I mean, this guy, uh, hitters aren't made. I mean, they're built. And Votto has, is a self-made hitter. Now you have to start out with some pretty good physical attributes. Obviously, he's got excellent eyesight, good hand-eye coordination. I mean, the guy works hard. I mean, he's in the weight room. He's constantly studying his own video his swing critiquing himself holding himself to a little higher measure than everybody else Motto running and a pitch taken toward the second and he is in there safely don't worry about that knee this year huh well, that was only injured, you may remember, going all the way back to 2012 in that regular season. Bob and him again a year later. Just 100 games in 14, and then he wondered this time a year ago, Chris could have come all the way back. And he came all the way back. He had a great season in 2015. There's ball four to Bruce. Barraza came in, the hottest Reds hitter on the team. 0 for 2 today. one into right center field that'll back up the center fielder who makes the grab and on the third goes Votto two away in the inning still a 2-2 game and Scott Shepler will try and change that Shubler, 25 years young. We told you he's a native of Iowa. And in the Dodgers organization in 2013 and 14, he was an organizational all-star during the year and then a postseason league all-star. Came to the Arizona Fall League two years ago, was named to the league's all-prospect team and was a Dodgers minor league player of the year. That was coming up. A rookie ball, single A, double A, and we told you triple A first time last year. And taking second is Bruce. One and two on Shubman. 
Little things like that are what the Reds are trying to emphasize in camp. Pitcher not paying attention to you, giving you a chance to move up. Bruce takes advantage of the fact that Wade Davis wasn't even looking over there. Shevlin growing up in Iowa was an incredible all-around athlete. He played baseball naturally, played football, basketball, soccer, and set his high school Cedar Rapids Prairie High track records in the 55-meter sprint, the long jump, the 800-meter relay. And out of the mid. Shevlin still alive. He elected to go to the junior college route. Played at Iowa Community College before being drafted by the Dodgers. on Shevlin. Pretty good at bat for him right now. Uh, he got away with the ball popping in and out of the middle of the catcher. But he fell behind against a guy like Davis 0-2. Took a ball, fouled two off. Took another ball, fouls one off. Hanging in there. Against one of the best relievers in baseball. Davis is, has strung together back-to-back -back tremendous years for the Royals. Earned run average last year at 0 0.9. The year before that, it was 1.0. Let I me mean, say, so he just doesn't give it up. Pretty good changeup right there and had Chevrolet right out in front. And he doesn't give it up here. We're tied at two at the end of five. Jim Day. Tom and Chris, you were talking about Brandon Finnegan bettering his chances to make the rotation. His chances got better this morning as well because of need. Michael Lorenzen's MRI results came back this morning on his pitching elbow, and it's good news, bad news for Lorenzen. The really good news is it showed no structural damage, no major tear of the UCL, but he has been diagnosed with a mild strain of the UCL and also some tendinitis in that elbow. He'll meet with Dr. Krimchek on Thursday and have a better plan and going forward, Brian Price, before he got the results, said if he shut down for any period of time this spring training, it'll be almost impossible to get him ready to make the rotation on opening day. Wouldn't rule out the bullpen, but that might be a long shot as well. So 
good news, bad news for Lorenzen. For the foreseeable future, he will not be pitching and will be resting. Also news on the Homer Bailey front and John Lamb front. We'll give you that to you when time permits. Well, time will permit here momentarily. It's two and two. Our count, we begin the sixth inning, and another young man has been nursing an arm injury on the mound for the first time in a long time. Saw him last year primarily as a starter, is Kiva Sampson. Akiva's trying to make the ball club this year as a reliever. He was given a number of stars last year. Young man that came over from the San Diego Padre organization. Made his way to the major leagues. I think he turned the corner a little bit when they put him in the bullpen. Really trying to pound the bottom of the zone, use his change up a little bit more. I mean, let's face it, the Reds have a lot of openings on their pitching staff. So, if you're a young guy like Samson in camp, you realize that every time you take them out, this is a do or die audition. He's only been out there one time before the injury. That was one and he struck out three batters against Cleveland, allowed one hit. Osmer pounds one down the third baseline, and that is a double. The Reds have made multiple changes on defense. We'll tell you about those as we move along. Well, the advantage of hitting the ball late, I mean, you hit it right out of the catcher's glove, and you can use the entire field without actually trying to drive the ball the other way. Osmer is good at that. Favorites and they have a lot of them. They have a lot of these young guys that have come up together. Juan Duran is now in left field for the Reds. Jake Cave, a young man trying to make this opening day roster, now in center. And Norman Rodriguez will take over in right. We'll just tell you about all the changes because there are so many. Brandon Allen now at first base. De Jesus remains in the game. Trey Hahn at short. Taylor Sparks now at third. Hit a mile high and way back into right. But a long, loud out. The runner advances to third, one away in the inning. had a one nothing lead in the top of the first the Reds got two in the bottom of the inning stayed that way until KC tied it in the fifth and now trying to take a lead for the second time one and one on board right there by Sam's really good pitch you throw that down and in slider left-hander you're trying to get it to land on their back foot most of the time they'll swing right over the top of it from Samson. Able to put away a hitter with a runner at third. One out in the inning. Now two around. 
These are the kind of at bats against good hitters that really remain in the mind of the evaluator. Brian Price being evaluator number one. Of course, the Reds have some of their own scouts in the stands as well. And the first four or five rows behind home plate are almost only filled with scouts. Well, the Reds earlier down there had what, uh, Jerry Walker? They had. Uh, He's been a right-hand man to Walt Jockety forever, and Walt's son, Super Scout Joey Jockety, down there. They're down there sitting next to each other. I'll tell you, Jerry Walker, good guy to sit next to. If you're going to pick oh, up some tips about yeah. how to evaluate players, you can learn a whole lot from Jerry Walker. Straight up in the air, and what a nice job done by Kiva Sampson if... In this high sky, it's handled cleanly, and it is. So he allowed a double to begin the inning. Got a big strikeout. He remained tied at two. Oh, yeah, extremely. You know, you got to, as soon as I was trading, I was talking to agents and a lot of the front office guys, and they were saying it's a great opportunity for you, you know, a system you can success. If you're successful, you know, you can move up throughout the ranks, and that's just, you know, a team that's wanted me that, that much to trade someone like Johnny Cueto is definitely another confidence boost for me, you know, to keep working my way up through the ranks. That is the mighty, impressive Cody Reed, and we'll have a full feature on him on the newest edition of Reds Weekly coming up tomorrow night. I'll also have a sit-down interview with Lou Pinnell, and it was a really good interview. You'll look forward to that. Six o'clock tomorrow night, Jeff Pecora hosting from the studio in Cincinnati, and my boy Doug Flynn joining me out here in Goodyear. Hope you can check, check out the latest edition of Reds Weekly. Well, that is always a great show, Kelvin. Herrera takes over on the mound for the Royals in a 2-2 game, and it's ball one to Ivan De Jesus Jr. Now, Jim, when the regular year gets underway, I know you'll be contributing to that show, but you'll go back to being with us every day, and Jeff McCoro is doing the show with Doug again. Is that right? Correct, yes, okay. uh, on a weekly basis, and uh, glad to have the glue aboard again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, Cody Reed has become, without a doubt, the talk of this Reds camp. And why not? And why not is right. But, of course, nowadays, Tom, there, and we had a discussion before the ball game about this with some of the broadcasters from the Royals, uh, about why teams are reluctant to have young players who've never been in the big leagues before make the team out of spring training where they can hold them back just a little while during the first month or so of the season mm -hmm. and thereby keep control over that player for an entire season longer. The same way the Cubs did with Chris Bryant last year. Well, we 
brought up the fact that, uh, you know, when you look back on it, and I think if you were to ask every Reds fan this question. In 2010, when the Reds brought up Johnny Cueto, he opened the year on a bad Reds team in 2010. It wasn't a physical team, but it wasn't a good team. He opened the year in the starting rotation. What he strike out 10, didn't walk a batter, allowed one run in a game against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Third game of the year, if I remember correctly. Mike Leak. Went from college baseball, his professional debut was in the major leagues. If the Reds would have waited a little more than two weeks on Cueto that year and on Leak a couple of years later, they would have one more year left on their contracts with the Reds. In other words, the team would have had control over them for another full season. Right. And they so you know. ask every Reds fan now, and it's not it's not second guessing. Nobody's going back and saying, oh, the Reds should never have done it. You're just asking the question as it pertains to Reed and maybe Stevenson this year, let's just say theoretically. Would you wait two weeks so you could have them for another full year? Well, the answer would be no doubt about it. Yeah, I, I don't know if the... The collective bargaining agreement then was the same amount of time as it is now. Meaning how long do you have to keep the guy in the minor leagues so that he doesn't lose that extra year of eligibility, so to say. The Reds in, in 2010, by the way, did win 91 games. They lost in a division series. Ten was leak. I beg your pardon. Cueto was two years before that. Okay. Um, yeah, Cueto was 12-7 and seven that leak. Right. And, and leak that year won eight games. So... Yeah, in retrospect, I think all the Reds fans who'd hear that argument and say, heck, yeah, we'd much rather have both those guys on this, on this team right now uh, where the Reds could afford to pay them, keep them together, and have them, you know, be much more competitive than they expect to be here in 2016. And that is the only reason I bring it up, because yeah. you can take it to the bank, if not tomorrow or the next day. Over the next 10 to 12 days, you are going to hear about Cody Reed and Robert Stevenson. And somebody's going to bring up, are they going to start the year with a major yeah. league team? Under a rebuilding job, wouldn't you rather wait on those guys for about three weeks? Cincinnati-Ville, April 4th through the 7th. Don't miss a full week of giveaways, fireworks, a 2016 team calendar, Reds blanket, magnetic schedule, so much more. Click up your tickets right 
right now, 381 RDS, select Kroger locations or log on to Reds.com. Can't wait to get it underway. Philadelphia Phillies coming to town two weeks from this Monday for the opening day in all the Major League Baseball. That'll be on April the 4th, and off day the following day as Chris O'Grady takes over. The Pirates will come in for the season's first weekend. Now, here's a young man trying to pitch his way into this Reds bullpen. Well, he has an advantage in one way, Tom. He's a Rule 5 player, which means the Reds have selected him off the roster of another team. And if he doesn't stay with the Reds Major League team all year long, he's offered back to that original team, in this case, the Angels, for half of the price, which is half of $50,000. You want to do that math publicly, or have we uh, totally ruled that out? Well, I practiced that uh, before we went on the air today, so I'm pretty confident that that $25,000 is the, is the look-see price. Just do me a favor. Favor. Give me a favor. Don't ever ask me the question the other way. <laughs> okay. Please. All right. Just don't do it. We have that agreement Thank in 2016. You. Thank you. Ever. And I mean ever. But O'Grady's trying to make it as a, you know, left-handed specialist coming out of the bullpen. His main pitch is a cut fastball. You know, he's only had one bad outing. He has had three really good outings. In fact, the three good outings have been perfect outings in three separate one-inning stint. Then he had one horrible game. Against the Giants, but everybody was terrible that day. Well, you know, the one thing that's working for him is that the Reds don't have a whole lot of left-handers to choose from down the bullpen. Precisely. The thing that is working against him, though, is his minor league splits. And when you split the stats up versus left-handers versus right-handers, left-handers have actually had a better batting average against O'Grady than have right-handers. Which kind of puts the manager in somewhat of a conundrum because you bring a left-handed specialist in who doesn't really specialize in getting lefties out. But he's out to prove the Reds wrong about that this spring. Great kid went to George Mason. In fact, he was all set to go to all the smaller college up around uh, the Eastern Seaboard, maybe University of Delaware, Rhode Island, and be a two-sport player. He wanted. He was a football quarterback in high school, very good one, and he injured his knee. To decide if maybe football wasn't for him. So he concentrated on baseball, went down to George Mason, and that's where he was drafted by the Angels. Well, the two out single, that one fisted into right field. I told you the Reds have Norman Rodriguez out there now in right. And here comes Raul Mondesi. I think we've heard that name before. Raul Mundesi. Well, right now, Omar Infante is the second baseman for the Royals. There are a lot of people think that this young man has got a chance to nail that job down by the end of the season. And yes, for those of you wondering, he is the son of the 1994 National League Rookie of the Year, played 13 years in the major leagues, and man was his dad. One talented and exciting Boy, player. Dad had an arm on him, didn't he? He could run, could hit for power. Boy, he had a, a lot of ability. His best years were spent, his father, he's a Dodger. Spent a little bit of time with Toronto for three years, Yankees a couple, one in Arizona, one in Pittsburgh near the end, and the Angels in Atlanta at the very end. Good breaking ball by Mr. O'Brien. Got a curveball on that cutter. I think that may have been more of a cutter. I mean, his fastball is not straight at all. It'll start at the center of the plate and end up in off the dish to a right-hander.
Nice work again by Mr. O'Grady. So four of his five outings have been rock solid. Good ball game here. 2-2. Two -two. in 48 hours for 17 or 18 straight weeks. Now, Jim, Day, you are dialed into NASCAR like nobody's business. What do you have down there as Peraza stings one off Duffy? And he is the, or I beg your pardon, that's Trahan to center field to begin the seventh inning in a 2-2 game. Jimbo? Well, yesterday, the car of A.J. Allmendinger made it to the Reds facility. Now, Kroger is one of the sponsors and Fry's uh, in the same ownership group there. And on that car is a tribute to Bernie Stowe. Now, that decal was on A.J. Allmendinger's car, not only at the Phoenix race, but at the Daytona 500, a classy move by those that are sponsoring this car. All the Reds players went and signed this car, and uh, very, very cool that Bernie Stell was in the Daytona 500. Very cool. One of the all-time greats, Bernie Stell, you will be missed so very much. Saw Hal Morris, former Red, yesterday. He came in along with Barry Larkin and so many others. I'm not going to start naming a bunch of names because I'll forget somebody, and I don't want to do that. When we all heard the sad news about losing our dear friend Bernie Stowe, they came from anywhere and everywhere to pay their respects to one of the giants in the history of the Cincinnati Reds franchise. A diminutive man, but a giant in baseball's oldest franchise. The late, great Bernie Stowe.
get to second base now. Yeah, the new pitcher is Danny Duffy. One of two left-handers out of the Royals bullpen. He was in 30 games last year. He was a starter for the most part. He had 24 starts last year. This year they're projecting him not as a starter, but in the bullpen. He is from Lompoc, California. Tommy, you know what they're famous for out in Lompoc? No. Well, other than the fact that most of the population out there has something to do with the Air Force Base, Vandenberg Air Force Base. Oh, sure. It was also known as the flower seed capital of the world. Really? That's no good. I never thought of it like that. You're probably right. Although it's a seed, you see. Seed, right? Jimmy, yeah, So yeah. maybe not. But they do bloom in the... Nice yeah, but are they getting... Are they getting the seeds to somewhere else so they can bloom somewhere else? Well, I mean, I'm sure they maybe they grow the flowers there and they get the seeds and then they sell the seeds so you can plant them in your garden. Oh, yeah. Big Terrace Park smells good. Always smells good. Taylor Sparks has to put down a bunt and he cannot successfully do it one away in the inning. Those are the little things that Brian Price has been talking about. On and on. Saying before the game today, he has never ever been a part of a major league camp where there are so many spots that are open for both players and especially pitchers. He said, You know, normally uh, this one's going to get away and both runners are going to advance. Duffy is all over the place. Brian said normally you go to spring training and it doesn't matter if say 15 maybe more of your 25 man roster could have a brutal spring but they would still be guaranteed a spot on the team well I'll take example of the Royals right here right you, you know the battle that they have in camp the battle that is in camp the Royals fans are watching on the seat of their chair every night the battle for backup catcher and it's almost a surely to go to the last year's backup catcher Drew Butera who caught the last pitch of the World Series and Tony Cruz who started the game this year or the uh, started the game today has options left so he'll probably be sent out that's the only thing they've got over. high throw and the runner is out of the plate oh I thought he got under it sure looked like it So Rodriguez had a chance to knock in the go-ahead run. Hits it right at the second baseman and the runner thrown out. Now here's a young fellow who's having a very good spring, and that is Jake Kane. Very first game, he had hits in each of his first two times up. Trying to win a spot on the Reds opening day roster. You know, from an administrative standpoint, there are guys that have advantages over others. One is if you are out of options. That means the organization will lose you if they try to send you out. And then the other, of course, is when you're a Rule 5 draftee. That's what Jake Cave is. So he, like Chris O'Grady, last innings pitcher, I mean, they're either on the team or they're being offered back to their source team. And in his case, that'd be the Yanks. Career 285 hitter in the minor leagues with an on-base percentage of 350 in his career. Been a double figure base dealer in each of his first three full pro seasons. Good eye there. You know, one of the only knocks about Cade, and it's a knock you could pretty much have on every left handed hitter outside of Joey Votto and maybe a handful of others, is the inability to handle left handed pitching. So this is a big at bat. And he draws a walk to load him up. 
with us when we kick into gear starting on April the 4th. All righty, they're loaded for Durand, who will be, of course, suspended for the first 80 games of this year. Testing for performance-enhancing drugs. But Brian Price made it quite clear he's not going to throw in the towel on this young man. He's seen quite a bit of playing time so far here in Arizona. One and one. Guy always caught your eye, Chris, through the years. Well, he caught my eye because they drafted, or they didn't draft him. They signed him as a 16-year-old. He was about 6'4". He's now close to 6'8". And that's a big strike zone to cover. He would just keep growing and growing. Prodigious home runs in batting practice, but he's just not made enough contact to really get into the higher levels of minor leagues. I guess there's no reason to throw the towel on a player as long as you have control over that player. And I think that's where the Reds are looking right now, although they're deeply disappointed that he failed a, a drug test. Well, that ball is hammered in the right field. One run scores, a second run will score, a two out, two run single by Duran. And the Reds have a two run lead here in the seventh inning. He puts a barrel on. I mean, it really goes. Slow roller to the right side, and that should end the inning. But a good inning for the Reds against Duffy. They scored twice to break a tie. They go to the end. Reds lead 4-2. Yesterday was just a one-inning outing. He was on a 20-pitch limit. Gave up hits in the first couple of batters, but then really settled in nicely. Now the question after his outing, does he have enough time to stretch himself out to be ready for the opening day roster? 
Sí, yo pienso que sí. Yo pienso que me siento I really feel the, the yes. Well, I'm going to be okay. I, I mean, with all the work that we've been doing, everybody together, everybody who's been working with, with me, and all the time that we have, next star will be two, two innings, and then we move up to the next one. I, I think it will be enough time for me to be ready. I, I really feel that I will be okay for the season. Ball goes well. He'll make enough starts to stretch him out, and uh, barring anything a set of a setback variety, he's a lock for that rotation, and uh, just to reiterate it there's not an injury that Iglesias is getting over they put him on put him on an off-season shoulder strengthening program and he says it's responding very very well well we were very excited to get a chance to see him back yesterday been waiting and all the reports were good and great to have him back Dusty Coleman to ground out one away. You know, Jim, uh, we let it get away from us that uh, you were going to give us an update on both Homer Bailey and John Lamb. Yesterday, Homer Bailey threw another bullpen session. It was 45 pitches through all of his pitches. He is due to make one more bullpen session with 45 pitches. Then they'll finally turn him loose to face some live hitters. There has been no bad news whatsoever. Homer Bailey coming back from Tommy John. Still on track to hopefully join the Reds in early May. As far as John Lamb goes, he had off-season back surgery. It's kind of been an up-and-down spring for John. But this morning, he finally threw off the mound once again through 20 pitches, all fastballs. But I talked to him afterwards. He says there's no pain, no discomfort. It's all about strengthening that back right now. But he's another guy that will not be ready opening day. So, you know, you take a look at... Uh Lamb, I think we both agree, Chris, uh, the Reds saw enough of him last year, enough good things from him last year, where of all these young guys going into spring training, he had a little more polish than maybe some of the others as far as to be in line for a spot in the rotation. Well, now all of a sudden, obviously, that's not going to happen. So you have Bailey, you have Lamb. Neither will be ready, probably for a month at least. Michael Lorenzen, as Jim brought up earlier, great news, no tear in the ligament in the elbow, but got to wait and see how long it's going to be before they fire him back up again. So, you know, outside of Di Sclafani and Iglesias, there are three spots open in that Reds rotation between now and opening. You're right, and they'll be spoken for by the time you figure that Homer Bailey gets back and maybe Lamb and Lorenzen. So it's really more wide open than anybody ever even sure. thought it would be coming into camp. I think Iglesias, uh, the way we're looking with, you know, with the off days you have early in the year, you know, you want, if they put him in the slot of the fifth starter, Iglesias, he should be ready in plenty of time to be able to just join right in. Yep. Lorenzen, of course, is the great unknown. You really don't know the extent of his injury until he meets with the doctors and figures out some kind of plan of action. That's a shame, too, because he really worked hard over there. It's a nice play down there at third. By Sparks to win. Sparks is a big guy. I mean, he went over there, fielded it, didn't even kind of straighten himself up. He just planted his right foot and fired it across the infield. Sparks only 23 years old. A second round pick just two years ago by the Reds. He is regarded, or at least last year, in Baseball America as the Reds' best defensive infielder in their entire organization. Best infield arm and best power hitter. So you might be hearing a lot about Taylor Sparks in the years to come. Reds back for what they hope is the final time, leading by two.
special opening night. Talked about that at the ballpark. The Reds walk the red carpet over in the Kroger fan zone. You can be one of the first 20,000 fans to get a team calendar presented by Kroger. It's fireworks after opening night. April the 6th. Come on down to the ballpark. We'd love to have you. Russ Hollendorf, Chris, has been in Pro Bowl since 2004. That's when he was drafted by the Arizona Diamondbacks. Round four overall. And we've seen him a lot. We've seen him, I think, as a member of the Pittsburgh Pirates. Big right-hander that went to college and graduated from Princeton University, where he wrote his thesis. He graduated with a degree in operations research and financial engineering. You know what's interesting is, you, you know, you hear that, right? And, and you think about a young man going to Princeton, and, and, and you know, I mean, that's a huge accomplishment, just getting into that school. Mm -hmm. I mean, athlete or no athlete, they don't give out scholarships in the Ivy League, if I'm not mistaken. Correct. Athletic scholarships. Yeah, that's what I mean. This guy grew up on a cattle ranch, started by his father in Lockhart, Texas. Now, maybe I'm stereotyping a little bit, but I think it's safe to say that most people would not think of a young man growing up in Texas on a family cattle ranch to necessarily be a young man that would attend an Ivy League school. Not that he couldn't get into one, I'm not insinuating that, but that he would decide to go to an Ivy League school. You get used to that sort of way of life, a lot of land. Homer Bailey comes to mind. Mm -hmm. He just loves that lifestyle. I mean, that is a world apart, brother, Princeton, New Jersey, from Lockhart, Texas. I thought it was interesting that Ollendorf wrote his senior paper on the value of Major League draft picks. Wow. So, I... I I agree with you. I guess you got to do something out there with your brain while you're watching those cows graze. Well, he made the most of it. Yeah. He's got the old-fashioned delivery going, doesn't he? Sure does. He's always been that guy that comes way over the top. I mean, you've never really, you don't see hardly any pitchers nowadays take a big step back, big rocking step back. Now they just take a little one. Watch him rock it back here. The other thing he does is when he steps back with his right foot, he takes his hand out of his glove, but the ball remains in his glove. I mean, you rarely ever see that. Normally, you get a grip on the ball, you don't want to let it loose. <laughs> That's the way they used to teach it. Look like Rob Dibble right there, didn't sure it? Sure does. It's the same number as Dibble. 49. And the same result of a Dibble and back. That's the kind of thing you see in a spring training game that you don't normally get to see throughout the year. So you, you, gotta, you gotta like spring training for the little things. Oh boy. Trahan with a bullet off the body of Oldendorf. Hopefully he's okay. I'm not sure what made the louder sound. The contact with the bat or the contact with the body. I mean, he turned and got him on the broadside. Well, we talked about him growing up on a Cattle Ranch. He's about as big as a cat. Well, no 
one's in a hurry to rub it. No. No. You see he's okay. You know, Trey Hand, young man, I, uh, I was down in the dugout before the game today. And he was the first one to come in from out in right center field. I never met him. Really didn't know much about him. I walked over, said, how are you, young man? I introduced myself. How are you, sir? It's amazing how the years go by and you become a sir. But... So where are you from, young man? I said, I'm from Louisiana. I said, oh, well, you probably grew up a big fan of the LSU Tigers. He looked me dead in the eye. Couldn't have been more serious. He said, no, sir. I am a fan of the Lou Lafayette. The University of Louisiana Lafayette. That's where he went to school. And he just picked up a stolen base. That's some wheels. He was the first Cajuns player to play in the USA Baseball Collegiate National Team. It's a good-looking young prospect. Sure. Third round pick just last year by the way. Hey, man, nice play at shortstop. This guy is a legitimate prospect for the Reds. He was just drafted, as I mentioned, last year. They sent him immediately to Billings. And I mean, in a short amount of time, you talk about making an impression. Hit well over 300. Drew more walks and he struck out. Extra base hits. They moved him to Dayton. Now, you don't see that a lot. Where, or Daytona, I beg your pardon, where, you know, they draft a guy. By the time you get him signed from his college year, they'll send him somewhere. Rarely do you see a guy immediately then bumped up to another level. Be interesting to keep an eye on him moving forward. Yeah, you never used to see these players that were drafted one year in the major league spring training game the next. Sure. You just have to go back on the back diamonds here to see really what you had in the minor leagues. Because at any one time, if you ever come down to spring training, you can go down there and you watch maybe two or three games at a time. It could be a ball on one field, triple A on another, extended spring, or a rookie ball, or even a double A on the third team. And then the teams that aren't playing there are off, off playing somewhere else. So they play a schedule just like the major leagues do, but they're just on the backfields. They've started their minor league games yet. I don't like the app. Which is one reason why you see so many of those players who have reported and reported in shape, obviously. Here at the big league level to give the big leader big leaguers a little bit of a a break and until they work their way into playing more innings. What a conversation, a short one, albeit with uh, Walt Jockety, the president of baseball operations for the Reds and you know, I asked him, I said, is there, to your knowledge, has there been any research or any study or any kind of conversation about the length of spring training? Because, as you all know, Chris, you were part of the era, many, many generations before you were. You know, there were guys that had work jobs in the offseason. They come into spring training to get in shape. It is rare to see a player show up now out of shape. Well, they better not, because they each have a essentially a homework list to do all winter long as far as what X not only come in shape but concentrate on certain muscle groups and so on that the ball club has evaluated and say they need improvement in. so I mean, you've got a personalized workout schedule handed to you you know whether you're a ma major leaguer or a minor leaguer but especially a 40-man roster guy in fact the big leaguers i think get a visit from the strength and conditioning coach. yes they do throughout the winter just to see how you're doing they just started recently. Well, the point I'm making is yeah, I think the players are starting to grumble from what I hear a little more and more and more with each passing year about the length of spring training. Well, the length of the day has gotten really ridiculously long. Because it used to be, you know, 
even for a workout day before the games begin say you show up in the middle of February pitchers and catchers and then regular players show up you know you get out to the ballpark at eight or nine o'clock you know you, you work until one or two and that's it but now these guys show up here at 6 30 in the morning and it's almost a race to see who can get there first to show that they're the most interested they're the most dedicated a lot of it's I watch staying around that long I mean you simply get mentally dulled one thing the Reds have done this year I thought was pretty good though they play a lot more situational games you know in practice Sparks gone swinging, and now the Royals will bat in the top of the night. Let's try to put it away. Let's pick six playing, guarantee an exclusive Joey Votto, 30-inch Louisville Slugger. Pick up any six regular season home games, including the big Hall of Fame weekend. Plus, receive six free McDonald's extra value meals. Buy the Reds pick six play and save up to 25%. Go to Reds.com for more information. Now, here is a young man out of South Dakota State University who's only been in pro ball for two years. And Chris, there are a lot of people talking about young Mr. Lane Thompson. Well, it's what he's done here in the first couple of years. As you said, Tom, last year, double A and plus, and then now in the spring training this year. You don't see all that many players coming out of South Dakota State. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, their nickname, my son and I were watching uh, some of the, the March Madness, and they're going to the tournament. They are nicknamed the Jackrabbits. It's a big league nickname. I would not have known that. Do you know what uh, league they play in? No idea. That would be the Summit League. Where he was the pitcher of the years his senior season. The Jackrabbits. I like that. You know, Luke would look good. Why, why don't you rename your... Youth baseball team, the Jackrabbits. It's not a bad idea. I think our uh, our rec commission would have something to say about that, since uh, everything they make and or sell goes by the Bulldogs. Oh. I'm totally on board with Jackrabbits. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you have a 10-team league, not everybody can't be the Bulldogs. Well, we don't play. We play teams from other areas of town, all over the town. We played Lakota, and we played Mason, and we played Madeira, and we played some others, you know. And so we're always the Bulldogs. So do you have, a, like, a picture of Uga? Yes. On your yes. jerseys? Yeah. Yes. No, not on the team jerseys, but that's, like, the sweatshirt yeah. you can yeah. buy. Yeah. yeah. Of course, I'm talking referring Slobbering. to Slobbering. University of Georgia, Uga. That's right. That is your best player, how about that? Leading by two. Royals 
Matt in the top of the ninth, and this is in the air to deep left center field. Duran gets there in time. One away. Well, Chris, you and I will reconvene here on Fox Sports Ohio one more time for opening day. That'll be on March of 25th. One more to go. For some of us to be here working on radio a little bit. But we want the, the big donkey. We want him rested up and ready to go. <laughs> Say only one more game for you. <laughs> I thought Adam Dunn was the big donkey. He's long gone. Old news. <laughs> Here in the, the, the Reds Fox Sports Ohio television booth, you are the big donkey. So we want you to, you know, whatever you're doing, going to the beach, going to the mountains, you know, whatever you're doing, going to somewhere where you lay in a mud bath all day long, whatever it is you're doing, wherever it is you're going, you've got 10 days to be ready to roll. Knocked down by Allen. And one more out to go for Sampson in the red. Well, thank you, Don. Good to be known that you've selected such an endearing term for your partner that you're going to be sitting right here. Now, if you're not sincere about that, I'm I may very, have. very sincere. You know I am. You don't want me to ask you to do math in public. Oh, the Lord knows. You know, even more embarrassing than being humiliated on television for lack of math skills. And, and it doesn't matter if, if there's, you know, our ratings are through the television roof. If there, there's hundreds of thousands, millions of people watching, you can be embarrassed. Nothing is more embarrassing than sitting down next to one of your children. An elementary age child. Say, hey, Dad. Have a little trouble with this tonight. <laughs> Can you give me a hand? Been there. And there's a glaze that comes over your eyes. And embarrassment is not quite the word. All right, Thompson trying to do what he has done all spring. And that is just mow down opposing hitters. He is not allowed to run in his first three outings, spanning four innings. Trying to go through a one, two, three, nine. Mark it down. We might be watching this young man on eight for the four. Interesting. So the Reds win by a final count of four to two over the Royals. And that man right there, Duran, breaking a two-two time with a two-run single in the seventh. We'll be back with more in a moment.